Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for uh, today's first MVC post-discharge follow-up work group of 2024. My name is Christy Degner, and I'm the Site Engagement Coordinator for MVC. I look forward to facilitating this work group for you all today. So today's post-discharge follow-up work group will feature a presentation by Lisa Powell of Sparrow Hospital. Lisa Powell is the Director of Clinical Operations at Sparrow Hospital located in Lansing. As part of the hospital administration team, she is responsible for day-to-day -day operations to enhance efficiency and improve clinical outcomes, including length of stay, mortality, and readmissions. Much of her work is in collaboration with the medical staff, focusing on clinical standardization, use of process-oriented approaches to daily workflows, and data-driven decision-making being embedded in improvement efforts. Lisa holds degrees from Davenport University in Applied Science, healthcare administration, and business administration. Outside of her role with Sparrow, she has served as the clerk for her local township for 22 years and enjoys giving back to the community. Thank you, Lisa, for being here today. Before you begin your presentation, I have a few brief housekeeping items. So first, the session is being recorded. The slides and the recording will be shared with the attendees following the work group. Next, we will be monitoring the chat throughout the presentation, so feel free to add questions there. We'll also have some designated time at the end of Lisa's presentation for a Q&A session. And then lastly, your feedback is very important to us. If you could please complete the post workgroup survey in a link that will be provided in the chat and in the email sent following the workgroup, that would be greatly appreciated. And as a reminder for hospitals participating in uh, P4P, who would like to receive credit for this work group, the survey is mandatory. And please note the one hospital that you are attending on behalf of so that you can appropriately receive that credit. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Lisa for her presentation. Thank you very much. I appreciate the introduction, Christy. Are you guys able to see my presentation okay? Looks great. All right, as Christy said, my name is Lisa Powell. I'm the Director of Clinical Operations at what is known for just a few more days as Sparrow Hospital in Lansing, Michigan. You will see if you're kind of following our journey, we have partnered with Michigan Medicine in Ann Arbor and our official um, brand relaunch will be beginning April 1st. So in the few weeks to come here, we will be known as University of Michigan Health Sparrow or UMH Sparrow. So my contact information with that rebrand shouldn't change. You're able to reach out to me in the same fashion as you can now. Um, if you want to learn more about this initiative, uh, post this work group discussion. So I'm going to share with you today work we've been doing over the past two years on managing our multiple visit patients or our highest utilizers and taking a more systems approach to how we deal with these patients. Really, um, where this started, um, oh, I pardon, just a little housekeeping here. I have no financial relationships to disclose before we move forward. And if you take a look back at where we were um, we started this work at the beginning of 2022, so we reflected back over the 12 months prior in 2021. We were in the midst of COVID. There was a lot of pressure constantly on lack of capacity in the acute care setting, really being good financial stewards, and really stretching those limited resources as far as we could every day we came to work. So one of the challenges was readmissions and Sparrow during that time was a significant outlier when we compared to our peer group. We were constantly in that 10 to 10 and a half percent all cause readmission rate and we were well below the median for other like hospitals. So with that, we partnered with one of our external partners, Visient. They do our risk adjusted um, quality data and they had a nationwide collaborative that brought together people who were underperforming on readmissions to look at how could we go about this differently to make an impact and improve our performance. Now we know we've all been looking at readmissions for decades, but a lot of times we were looking from that core measure mindset. We were looking at our readmissions on total hips, total knees, COPD, CHI, and we did make progress, but we would plateau and we would kind of get stuck and then really be challenged to figure out how can we continue to improve month over month, year over year, and so they challenged us to start to deep dive our data differently and kind of just throw that core mindset measure over to the side and look at different ways to segment our data. 
So we started looking at age, ethnicity, what type of comorbidities did our readmitted patients have? Their gender, was it more in a certain zip code? Was it more with patients that did or didn't have a primary care doctor? Really just trying to get into what are some of the other reasons why, if it's not specifically just that condition they were readmitted for, but what is making them such a high utilizer of acute care services in our hospital? And really what was overwhelming every time is it was a lot of data. And we scratched our heads and thought, okay, yes, maybe it's more women than men, or maybe it's more, you know, this bucket than that bucket. But we really had a hard time wrapping our head around it and figuring out, okay, we're learning a lot more about our patient population, but what do we do with this? And it also was a large number. When you look at people and say, we have hundreds of patients who are readmitted, and people felt instantly overwhelmed by that and really trying to figure out like, you know, what can we do about that? So we really just kept digging and digging and digging and trying to narrow and narrow and narrow. And finally, somebody said, let's just run it by patient. And we thought, that's crazy. That's going to be so many people. But what we did is just try to look at the top of the list. So we ran it by number of combined inpatient and observation admissions over 2021. And to get it down to something we can deal with, what kind of jumped out at us? Our like outliers, our highest utilizers, it was only 35 patients. And then all of a sudden people got not quite so overwhelmed by it. And they thought 35 patients, like we could make a difference on 35 patients. And there was huge opportunity here because although it was only 35 patients, cumulatively over the course of 2021, those 35 patients had 434 admissions to our hospital here in Lansing. And those admissions totaled over 2,000 acute care days. So suddenly it became manageable and it became real. If we can make just a 20% improvement in this, we could decrease over 80 admissions and save over 400 hospital days. That's 80 more people in our community that had a need at that time that could get a bed and 400 more days where we could serve other people if we could get a better handle on what kept driving these patients back to our hospital. And this is what really finally helped define our definition of a multiple visit patient. And we landed on patients with 10 or more combined inpatient and observation admissions over the past 12 months. The thing I wanna remind people is just remember as we go forward and you listen to this and what we did, our definition doesn't have to be your definition. So if you go back and decide to look at your data in this manner, you might land on a different number. You might have to start with patients who had 15 or more, or maybe you can only focus on six or more. I can tell you we started out at six or more and it was hundreds and it just felt like it was untouchable. We then started to look at these specific 35 patients in more detail. What was driving their readmissions? Who was their payer? Kind of those same segments we went and looked at the whole group, now we started looking at it for just these 35 patients so we could start to understand what might be driving this, what were some of the barriers, what were some of the resources these patients had. So you can see like in here, a lot of people would be surprised we had several patients with Blue Cross. They would think that they would have more access to care and resources. We did have a significant number of patients in the Medicaid population. So we started to ask ourselves why. why? Why do these 35 patients have to come back to the hospital over and over again? And we started to learn some things about their care. It was very transactional and episodic. It felt like every time they presented, we kind of started from scratch and worried about that one interaction or that one admission, that one ED visit. And there wasn't really anybody looking at the big picture longitudinally over their entire care. It also felt like a lot of times we just started from scratch or reinvented the wheel every time they came. We also looked at it and found there was kind of a little bit of a follow the leader mentality. The ED provider was a single decision maker as our system is designed to be, but the admission tended to be the easy button. And there was a lot of feedback from the providers. Well, if this patient's been here for this condition 10 times, and everyone before me has admitted this patient. They're presenting clinically in the same manner. You know, what is the foundation for me to say, I'm not going to admit the patient this time? Nobody wanted to be that first one to break the pattern. 
We also did realize there are some diagnoses for which we lacked standardization and care pathways for in our emergency department and our hospital itself. We located um, gaps in our transitions of care and our post-discharge care management. As I mentioned earlier, there was also a little bit of a, a Medicaid issue. So one of the um, plans you'll see in the slide, Meridian, you know, that was a huge eye opener for us. We accept Meridian inside the hospital, obviously, but our ambulatory network at that time didn't take Meridian Medicaid. So once our patients transitioned out of the hospital, they had no access to care. Our labs didn't take their insurance. Our primary care doctors didn't take their insurance. Our specialists didn't take their insurance. So they really kind of fell into a hole once they left the hospital of, you know, being told, no, we can't help you. And then obviously in this population, there was also a lot of social determinants that had a factor. So figuring out what we could do, because in that time, I'm sure we all have a little bit of PTSD. We were all overwhelmed. Constrained was the word. We were resource constrained. The thought of getting funding or additional approval for new programs was probably close to impossible. There was not going to be new staff. We couldn't develop anything that required new FTEs, new positions, more people. Everybody was doing their job and maybe somebody else's and maybe somebody else's job on top of that. So everybody was time constrained. And it just felt like whatever we did here, we needed to keep very simple. So how could we take something so complex and turn it into something simple that would really make a difference? But we really did start from hypothesizing. How could we make it easier the next time this person walks in the doors to our emergency department? How could we make it so the physician didn't have to start from scratch trying to figure out what to do? How could we get away from that episodic care and make it feel less transactional? What if we could close a couple of these gaps, even if we just started one patient at a time? Tra get them into a clinic, help direct them to the right setting of care, what if we could remove barriers? They haven't had a specialist for their certain condition in years. How could we make the connection and maybe get them into engaging in specialty care? So we knew we had to make it not only easy for um, the patients to navigate, but easy for the team to come up with. What we did find when we started socializing this concept is these patients were very well known to our providers. Most of them could speak to the reasons for their frequent admissions, could talk about their last couple of times here, knew some of their barriers, some of their challenges. Um, so it didn't take hours and hours of deep dive and chart audits and you know learning and studying. They managed these patients over and over again, and they were actually very happy to come to the table and engage with us because they could see where having a better plan for these patients would make the clinical management of them better. So we identified our key stakeholders and thought we're going to bring a multidisciplinary work group together just to talk about what if we could just create some kind of real-time support, some kind of standing resource that was accessible that would help people understand in the moment, give me some elbow support for this patient and don't make this so much work for me. So we did a couple of um, sample patients. We ran through a couple. And what we did, we allowed the physicians or anybody who was going to have input on their management to kind of work offline. And they each did a little paragraph on their perspective for this patient from the medicine perspective. If the patient had a cardiologist, here's my perspective. If the patient had a GI doctor, kind of here's my perspective. So everybody could do their little um, pre-work offline on their own time when it fit in their schedule. And like I said, most of them would tell us it would take them 20 to 30 minutes at most because these patients are not new to them. They're very well known. And we would have a one hour virtual meeting and bring all the specialties together where we would bring all of their pieces of their plan discuss them briefly and come to consensus and make sure everything aligned and integrated well and everybody was on the same page. And everybody who was a part of that patient's care team signed off on that and said, yes, we agree with this plan. So I provided a couple examples of some plans we used. Um, this one was more about a, um, a coordination. So what we did is we created, it would almost come into like a Word document format when we got done, but it would give some guidance in real time. So here's this multidisciplinary care plan note, lives in our electronic medical record, and we'll tell the provider, this patient had consistency in care problems. So I don't know if other hospitals experience what we do. Sometimes patients don't like 
um, their plan of care. So they'll leave and represent a few hours later and try to get a different physician with a different answer. Or we even just had clinical variation among providers that they would approach things very differently. So this one was more about creating a more consistent care plan for this patient. So it would give these very specific guidelines for every time this high utilizer, this multiple visit patient would present to the emergency department. We can also use them in other approaches, like when there's very complex care, when we had very difficult transitions of care, um, where anywhere that we felt like we risked having a failure, we could put something together that gave this guidance to make more consistency for people and make it easy. So we took the time to develop, I think we initially did five of these care plans. And then our question was, well, a lot of times we make great tools and provide great resources, but the clinical adoption of them is challenging. And we put them out there and we tell people, hey, here's this great new thing for you. It's going to make your job easier. And then nobody uses it. So we knew we had to make it easy to use and easy to access in real time. And that's one of the things I like most about this initiative is it really was a very low resource intensity initiative. So the providers were happy to come engage because they knew not much of their time had the potential for a great return on investment. And the build for it was very simple. So I will tell you, we used layered tools. One of them was an FYI flag. And I will be very transparent that this was the least effective tool. If you, you guys use FYIs in your organization, I know our experience is you can get multiple FYIs for a patient. And you'll see that small number by that flag. It will just increase. And it'll say there's three FYIs, there's four FYIs. They're kind of small and off to the side. They don't jump out in people's faces and they have to go hover over it to see what all of those things say. And I find that they frequently get ignored. So although we continue to use the patient FYI, this alone would not be an effective tool in changing clinical behavior. So I think it's beneficial to have it there, but probably what not led to the most effective change. What I think was the biggest key to this is when we did upload these notes into our electronic medical record, we created a specific note type called an MVP note. Why this was important is the feedback we got from our providers is with these high utilizers, you know when you go look at their chart, there's just stacks and stacks of notes and they tell you, I'm not going to go hunt for something. If it's not extremely apparent to me, if it doesn't pop out to me in the first 30 seconds, I'm not going to go scroll through the last 12 months of notes to try to find a particular thing I'm looking for or read the last six clinic notes or you know, go try to find the last time they were at their cardiologist or their GI doctor. It just doesn't fit well in the workflow in the emergency department. So we made it filterable by note type. And when we modify a note, we sunset the old one. So when they do go search for these, there will only ever be one in the chart for the patient. So when they go to the notes, you can see on the far right, they can click on that MVP note type and it'll pop up the one and only MVP plan of care note that exists for that patient. So most of our providers will tell you they can easily find this note in 20 seconds or less, which makes them more likely to use it and um, in their day-to-day -day practice because we've made it easy. The other thing we've tied to it is a BPA. I know BPA gives a lot of providers anxiety. They get BPA fatigue and they feel like we create a lot of them. But you have to remember in our initial um, iteration of this, we were looking at 35 patients. So it's not going to be extremely interruptive in their everyday work because it's only going to fire for these 35 patients. So every time a provider opens a chart for these patients that have this note type, this advisory will, will fire. And it will tell you, hey, heads up, we've created a really nice care coordination plan for you. Here's how you link to it in the notes in the chart review. So we even gave them like, here's a shortcut to go find it. We recommend you go read this because this is going to help you do your job better, help you provide better care for this patient. So these three tools together, least effective BPA flag, but the specific note type with the, with the BPA advisory that links to it, we found to be very effective. And you can create... Um, reports that will allow you to monitor um, providers' interaction with the BPA so you can see when this fires, if they click, you know, that they'll review it at a later time or if they actually open the note. 
So then you could have one-on-one -on -one coaching if you need to go and have that next iteration of, hey, we created this, your peers are using it, you're not. Can you help us understand why? And it might be a knowledge gap or it might be a preference gap, but you can really help drive people to use this resource um, when you tie this BPA to it. So we really um, thought that was highly effective. So low resource intensity. It was not a complex IT build. It didn't take a lot of people resources. We needed no extra money and no extra FTEs. And we set out a goal to decrease our utilization by 20% in the first year. And we met our goal in four months. And as you can see there, we have sustained our goal for two years and we continuously um, are improving over time. We're really excited about this because um, not only did it make a big difference for our side from a utilization perspective, but imagine these patients. Our highest utilizer in 2021 was admitted for 208 days of one calendar year. When we had better care coordination, when we had consistency, when we had multidisciplinary communication, we gave that patient part of her life back. She got to spend more of her life outside of the hospital than inside of the hospital, which is what, not what she had known prior to that. So cumulatively across these patients, you know, not only do we decrease readmissions, we decrease their average length of stay, we decrease the amount of times they're in the hospital, we improve their quality of life. And retrospectively, it would have been great for us to do some kind of pre and post intervention survey. Um, so something that could take this uh, a little bit more mature. Um, we also didn't tie it a strong financial analysis to this. So I would recommend you consider those things if you um, think about implementing this work. Uh, there was a lot of positive provider feedback for this as well. Satisfaction on their end because they did feel like it made it easier for them to do their work. No longer needing to sit around the ED and wait for a consult to occur because they need specialty input. A lot of times we can take that off their plate because they could learn what they needed to know from the note much more consistency. They felt like there was less risk on their end because they were all kind of uh, rowing in the same direction and on the same page when it came to care of that patient. So not only did we decrease the number of acute care days, we decreased the number of people that meet the definition. So that 10 or more kind of um, threshold for patients, we started out with 35, right now we're down to 15. And what I will tell you is to keep in mind, that this is not exclusively 15 left of the original 35. We worked on the original 35, but while we were doing that, we have more people that were kind of like the eight admissions, nine admissions that have doubled over that threshold. So we still have some work to do on them, but still overall highly successful and we're very proud of this work. So you can see over 2022, when we were doing the most active part of us work initially, month over month, consistent improvement in our 30-day all-cause um, rolling 12 readmission. We just kind of kept on that trajectory coming down. And you can see as we sustained this work in 2023, don't judge us for a horrible October. We can talk about that another time. We've been pretty consistently now down in the, you know, eight and three quarters to 9% range. We are now performing from a readmission perspective better than our peer group, which was significant improvement. Um, and we're really happy about that performance. And now we're challenging ourselves to go back at this and take another shot, do another iteration, that cycle of learning PDCA and see if we can take this work even farther. So I will tell you some of the ancillary things that kind of happened that we didn't anticipate. Uh, the tools began to be used, not just for these multiple visit, visit patients, the high utilizers, we would have people that we thought were kind of going to be difficult transitions of cares, or there would be these one-offs here and there where they don't meet the definition, but we think there's value in putting this clinical guidance in their chart for other people to use. Providers began to escalate patients. They'd be like, hey, hey, I got one. Can we work on this one? I think we should have me an ED doc, you know, our neuropsychiatrist and, you know, their cardiologist all come together and have a talk about this patient. I will be honest, this project got put on hiatus twice. And the nice thing is it can easily be shelved and it can be picked back up. So you can see, even though we shelved it for a little while, 
it continued to improve on its own. Just having that resource in there for, for providers and standing guidance, it continued to create benefit for the hospital and for the patients, even though we weren't actively working on it for about three months, creating new plans and those kinds of things. So we are now working on patients um, that have eight admissions, nine admissions, you know, kind of some more carve out niche uses where we think it'll have benefit for our health system specifically. So just to summarize, I think the biggest key is those layered tools. I think if you don't package this together with the specific note type and the BPA, you're going to struggle to get clinical adoption. We need to make it easy for people to find and easy for people to use or they're not going to embed it in their workflow. Um, one of the things, successful sustainment does require a regular review of these plans. We have these plans locked down pretty tight in our organization because you know, we're a big teaching hospital. We didn't want any resident who rounded on a patient to be able to modify the plan. So only our medical directors are able to actually physically update the note in the electronic medical record. So anybody can escalate feedback to them and say, you know, hey, this patient's presentation is modified slightly. I don't think this piece applies anymore. So there is that ad hoc update where you can reach out and say, you know, to our lead physician, I think we need to look at this, but we also have them on a cadence of an every six month review. So a physician goes and looks at their plan just to make sure that it's still aligned with the patient's current need and things haven't changed so that we are um, staying up to date as their, you know, care progresses. And then the other thing that's important is, you know, continuing to evolve this and look at how can we use other use applications? How can we improve the tool? Now, how can we spread this to other areas? Because we've obviously proven with very little investment, we were able to make significant improvement and sustain that improvement. So um, I think you can package this together nicely in something that feels like it's attainable um, and make a big difference for your organization and for the patients that you serve. So with that, I will entertain any questions that people have. I appreciate your time this afternoon. Thanks so much, Lisa. Really great and important work. Uh, what questions do we have for Lisa today? You can either unmute or you can also post in the chat and we'd be happy to, to look in the chat as well.